No, I think I think we can we can start. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to this uh, last Gong Show Gong Show session of the meeting. Um, well, for the the first speaker is going to be Davide Buffalini, who is going to be talking about black hole microstates from the worksheet. Davide, you have five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Davide Buffalini, and I'm going to start my third year of the PhD under the supervision of David Turton. And I'm working with Sergio Iguri and Nikolas Kovensky on a couple of things. One is already published on JHAP, and the second one is a work in progress. I'm going to tell you about at the end. Next. So the reason why I'm here talking to you is because of this, because of the black holes. There are a lot of questions surrounding them. And in particular, the things I want to address is how do the microstates of the, blue, of the black hole look like in, in the gravity picture? And can string theory help us with this quest? Now, what is string theory suggesting is that if you carefully look inside a black hole, you have found a bound straight of strings and brains. And this was strongly suggested by Strominger and Bapa with this famous D1D5P black hole. Now, rather than using the D1D5P black hole, and what we're going to discuss is going to be the S dual of it. So it's going to be the F1 and S5P black hole. Next. We're going to consider S5 F1P bound state, which are also not supersymmetric. And there are three regimes, roughly speaking, that you have to have in mind. From far away, you can see an observer that say, okay, I see something that looks like, like a black hole. And this is in the asymptotically flat regime in the full solution. And you have the three charges and you can play with them. You can take them of the same order. But if you take, for instance, Q5 to be much bigger than the other ones, you enter the linear dilaton regime uh, in the so-called NS5 decoupling limit. There is an additional regime, which is called the ADS regime, in which you take, for instance, QP to be the smallest of the charges. And this is where you do the standard ADS holography. Next. And what happens is that, thanks to Emil Martinek and Stefano Masai, we have an exact worksheet description of what happens from the linear dilaton into the ADS regime. We lack of the full asymptotically flat uh, description in terms of worksheet. Uh, this is an open problem. Uh, we may be going to address in the future. And there's also a lot of interesting physics related to little string theory and all these kind of things, but we don't have the time to address it. So the technology that we use is um, null gauge vestumin witten model. Let's start from the vestumin witten model. This is the action. The first term is the kinetic term. And the second one is the H field, uh, the exterior derivative of the B field. Let me explain. So G is a map from the worksheet into a target space I'm going to show you soon. And M2 is the word sheet, and M3 is an auxiliary space. It's a three-dimensional space. It has as a boundary the word sheet itself. Next, the target space uh, includes an ADS three times the three region for motivation you can guess. And you can also have an, an extra time direction, an S1Y and a T4. If you count, this is a 10 plus two dimensional space time. But the, at the end of the day, what we do is to quotient by two U1s in such a way that you end up with a model which is nine plus one, as it should be for critical string theory. So we have to worry, it's really nine plus one dimensional. Now, when you do the gauging, you introduce gauge fields and these gauge fields come with the currents and the currents on the right are expressed in terms of coefficients, L1, L2, L3, L4, which are just numbers. Now, these numbers are really important. So I'm going to highlight this because it's really important thing. Now, if you integrate out the gauge fields because they're Lagrange multiplier, you get, next slide, exactly um, this one here which is a bit uh, horrible, but at the end of the day is not. <coughs> okay. And you can see there are a lot of coefficients at two or three or four. So you can actually check if it's consistent or not. So next, if you, if you require the absence of CTCs, you have the condition that L3 should be equal to R3. And this happens to be exactly the same thing that, it ha that, that you have if you require the absence of horizons. And if you want this to be smooth, you have the same condition plus extra quantization conditions on the coefficient. Next. So what happens on the worksheet CFT? What happens is that you have, okay, string theory is a, a, a theory with constraints. So you have to have constraints and we sort of constraints must be imposed, okay? The other thing you have to impose is these are called null gauge constraints that if you want, they follow from BSD quantization. And there is also not a nice discussion about the gauge, uh, gauge spectral flow invariance, namely that if you shift this parameter omega, which is spectral flow parameter by a certain amount, and you reshuffle the quantum numbers, the state doesn't change. And what happens in the worksheet CFT is the following. Next. That you get exactly the same condition. So what I'm telling to you is that the worksheet CFT, the consistency, of the worksheet CFT is asking you that in the bulk, in the geometry, you don't have horizons, CTCs, and the thing should be smooth. This is consistency from string theory. So let me say briefly that happens uh, for correlators. 
And not all, every one of you may know that also word sheet correlators are dual to uh, um, U1D5 CFT operator, for instance, and correlators of it. And the worksheet knows about holography. And um, next, the question that we ask and we're going to work on is can we reproduce uh, correlators of the D1D5 CFT from the word sheet? The answer seems to be yes, and we're working on this. We are reproducing Hawking radiation, reproducing heavy light, light heavy correlators, and so on. That's a work in progress. Thank you very much for your attention. Bing, bing, bing. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you very much. So for our next speaker is Gabriel Palau, who's going to be talking about hack duality for the free scalar field. Well, first of all, thanks for the place. Uh, this is a work I did in collaboration with Alan Garbas, who is my director. Uh, and it is a review about hack duality. Next, please. Uh, well, the work was written in the language of algebraic quantum field theory. Uh, briefly, this theory assigns to each region of space-time an algebra uh, corresponding with the physical operations performable in the region. Basically, this algebra is the algebra generated by all fields, spinned out with functions whose support is in the region in question, and is called uh, the, the net. Uh, in order to this net has some physical meaning, uh, it must satisfy some physical actions such as isotony, uh, additivity, point carry invariance. But for question of times, I will only introduce locality. And uh, locality says that observable, observables associated to space like separated regions must commute and can be reformulated as an inclusion saying that observables associated to region O prime must commute with those of region O. Note that the prime on the left applies on regions and is the causal commutant, the causal complement, whereas the prime on the right of the inclusion applies on algebras as is the commutant of the algebra. Next, please. Next slide, please. The, the next one, please. <laughs> oh, please. I, I, I don't know. Um, no, the, the previous one. Thank you. <laughs> and the previous one. Ah, okay. Um, what, uh, okay. What high duality assert is that the algebra corresponding to the causal complement of a region O is actually the commutant of the algebra associated to O. So the the locality action is actually um, an equality. Well, high duality has been proved in many different contexts and has important consequences on entanglement measures in quantum field theory. And um, well, our uh, it is a review, so our so many proof was expanded uh, for clarity. And we also did the, the work of link the results of Araki and Equinanser Walder, uh, clarifying uh, the, the points in the Equinanser Walder proof using the Mintatak theory in a more direct, direct way. Our proof only works in ration as the one we show in the picture, uh, that, uh, the previous one, as the one in the pictures. Uh, that is the domain of dependence over fixed time ration, usually call it diamonds over the fixed time ration. Next one, please. When we have a, an algebra acting on a Hilbert space, we can define an operator uh, S, call it, usually call it the modular involution, and we can apply the polar decomposition to it, uh, obtaining two operators. The most important, important for us is shape. This shape enable us to calculate the commutant of an algebra by applying this strong result of the Mita Takasaki theory. Actually, the proof was separated in two steps. The first step, usually called the first quantization map, uh, is a map who send a space time ration to uh, subspaces of the one particle space. And to prove the duality here, we follow Araki. 
and the second quantization map is a map who takes subspaces of the one particle space and assigns a von Neumann algebras. To follow this, uh, to prove the high duality in this context, we follow Ekman Walder uh, with a simplification of his proof. Uh, next one, please. As I said before, uh, we doesn't expect that the high duality uh, to hold in all kinds of regions. So we present a, a regions who breaks high duality. And this region clearly uh, can be a diamond. Uh, actually, it is a union of two time-like separated diamonds. And again, we clarify all the points by explicitly writing down all the steps in the work of Araki. Thanks. Beep, um, beep, 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 beep. Thank you, Gabriel, very much. Um, can I remind everybody that, that we, we should postpone the questions to to the last uh, discussion session. So- uh, Can you hear me? Yes, now, yes, we can hear you very well. Now our next speaker is Joaquin Lineado, um, who is gonna be talking about what's so central about the central charge. Please, Joaquin. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for this opportunity. Uh, in fact, I will, I will be talking about what's so central about the central charge. Next, please. Uh, so, so the central charge naturally appears in the study of two-dimensional CFTs, which, as we very well know, uh, are applied to uh, statistical models, West Sumino with the models, chiral algebras, W algebras, and of course the ADS CFT correspondence. Next, please. Uh, and one of the distinctive features of two-dimensional CFTs is the fact that the symmetry algebra is infinite dimensional. Uh, which at the classical level or, or at the coordinate level uh, satisfies uh, the commutator algebra of, of the width algebra. And remarkably, when, when passing to the quantum theory, uh, an extra term appears uh, containing, containing a central charge. Next, please. Which is, of course, the, the Virasoro algebra. And, and, and we may wonder where, where does that central term actually come from? And the, the usual procedure is to, to consider the stress tensor of the theory, consider a mode expansion, and take the, the modes of the stress tensor to be the, the generators of the quantum algebra. And we, we can compute the commutation relations by, by computing the OPE of the stress tensor, which is uh, shown there. Shown, shown there that has uh, this, this anomalous term that contains a central charge. And notably, this structure of the OPE is, is not something that is proven in general. Uh, there are several arguments to, to argue that, that it should take out that form. And in particular, there, it, it can be verified for, for several, several known Lagrangian theories, but it's, it's, it's not a, a, an absolute statement. Next, please. And so the idea was to, to talk about an alternative point of view, uh, which is to un understand the appearance of the central charge uh, from a more general geometrical perspective. Uh, concerning realizations of, of symmetry algebras or group. And the idea is that uh, we may have an object which is like that red sphere and a certain uh, algebra acting uh, on that object. And then when we change our object from the sphere to that uh, uh, weird manifold, uh, it may happen that, that, that the algebra uh, is not able to realize in the same way, but instead uh, it, it might suffer a, a certain modification. Next, please. And in, in our case that we, we will be dealing with, with a quantization procedure, uh, our red sphere uh, will be the, the projective space of one dimensional linear subspaces, which is what we usually take uh, to be our, our physical uh, space of states, which basically is the original Hilbert space quotiented by, by an equivalence relation that relates uh, all, of, all of the vectors that are related by, by a complex phase. Uh, that are to be regarded as, as the same element. Next, please. So the question is, uh, if, if we want to, to represent uh, a symmetry via, via an algebra uh, acting on our red sphere, which will be uh, our, our projective space, uh, the question is, what happens uh, in the original Hilbert space? 
uh, that is where we actually want to define our operators so we can so we can have a uh, unitary representations which in the end is what we are looking for so the question is uh, is, is every every representation defined over the projective space uh, somehow related to, to a representation defined on the original Hilbert space? Next, please. And so notably, uh, the, the, this relation exists, but uh, the relation is when, when we have a projective, represent, uh, a projective representation that is a, a representation of the algebra that uh, gives you operators in the projective space, uh, that that representation lifts not to exactly the same algebra, but uh, to a central extension of the algebra, which in the case of the Witt algebra, it has uh, essentially a unique central extension, which is uh, the Virasoro algebra. Uh, next, please. So, uh, so that we may understand the, the, the need, the requirement to, to, to include a central charge in terms of including a central extension of, of the algebra, as, as an obstruction to lifting a, a projective representation. And, and although uh, it's, it's a purely mathematical argument, uh, it, it certainly doesn't depend on, on, a, on, a, on a Lagrangian description or, 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 or a, 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 an existing phys physical system so, so that we may compute the, the OPE. And in particular, <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's the last. And in particular, uh, well, the question, the question is, uh, what, what's the relation? What's the relation between both? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Joaquin, for your talk. Um, well, our final speaker of the this Gong Show is Sergio Morales Tejera, who is going to be talking about chiral magnetic effect in the quark gluon plasma from holography. Okay, so as you said, I'm Sergio Morales Tejera. I'm a PhD student under the supervision of Carl and Steiner, and I'm going to talk about, well, the CME in the QGP from holography. So first of all, what is the current magnetic effect? It is the generation of an electric current in the presence of an external magnetic field and a currently imbalanced medium. And it's a consequence of the axial symmetry of QCD in this case being anomalous. Next, 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 again. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this effect is being searched in the in heavy and collisions. So let's discuss a bit the physics there. So you make two nuclei collide, and right after the collision, you get a new state of matter, which is the quark gluon plasma, at a confined um, state where quarks and gluons are all around the place. And it has been measured in this plasma that there is a very low shear viscosity to entropy density ratio, very close to the one given by the lower bound in holography. So this is usually taken as a signal that the plasma is strongly coupled. So holography is best is suited for these kind of things. And now I want to answer to two things at a time. The first one is why is the CME important and is it feasible to observe it in heavy and collisions? And to the first question, well, the CME has interest in itself, but one can also draw an analogy to the baryon asymmetry problem and this is precisely by probing non-trivial topological uh, gauge field configurations. So how does this work? So you start with, um, with this plasma uh, with zero winding number, so curly balanced medium, and you start uh, walking a random path in this, thick, in this theta vacuum, uh, and you change the winding number. Now this activates the gluonic part of the axial anomaly, and you will flip the chirality of some fermions, so you get a curly imbalanced medium. This is was the first ingredient for the CME. And then you have the magnetic field, which is granted because you have uh, charged particles uh, moving around. So let's see, next, next, what is the experimental status of this search? So uh, at LHC, apparently they see no chiromagnetic effect at all. Whereas at RIG, the other accelerator, they have something that is, okay, it's something more significant. Well, this is actually not true because last week they released new data and now the claim is that they see nothing in either of the accelerators. So let's construct a model and see what we can learn to the CME. So we follow a bottom-up approach. We have asymptotically anti-deciter space-time, and we introduce uh, two gauge fields that are dual to the axial and vector symmetry transformations. And the Chern-Simon terms uh, reproduce the, the anomaly in the quantum field theory. 
we propose an ansatz that is, uh, of course, compatible with the symmetries of our problem, where we include the two ingredients, uh, namely the magnetic field and um, an axial chemical potential. So next. And the question I want to answer is, how long does it take to build up the CME current if one starts with nothing? And this is relevant because the magnetic field in the collision has a finite lifetime. And the CME takes some time to build up. So this interplay uh, between both time scale is certainly relevant for observations. So I'm going to address this. As an initial state, I take a static non-expanded infinite plasma where nothing happens. So no current, no personal isotropy. And these parameters, a axial charge magnetic field, our energy density, are taken to be uniform and constant in time. Next. Uh, we simulate for typical parameters of both accelerators. So we take these typical values for temperatures, chemical potentials, and magnetic field. And the value of the strength of the anomaly in holography is matched to QCD. And we get this value, and hence we run the simulations. So here we only have to focus on the orange upper curves. So in the left, I have the result for RIC, and in the right, I have the result for LHC, and you will see the time it takes to build up. So for RIC, uh, we get that at 0 0.5 Fermi over C, you should see already the CME, whereas at LHC, it will, it's faster, you, you find that 0 0.1, so next. So what are the main results we get? Well, first of all, the equilibration times, we find 0 0.38, which is closer to experiment than the previous estimations made by Chesler and Jaffe in a modern way. They didn't take into account the effect of the anomaly. And the other thing is that we took an estimate of the lifetime of the magnetic field in terms of the energy of the collision. And we find these lifetimes, and if we compare them to what we saw back then, uh, we see that at LHC we will not see anything whatsoever. Whereas at RIC, we might have a chance, but it has been shown that you also see nothing at RIC. So the take home message is that as you lower the energy, beep, beep, beep. more chance beep, beep, beep. to observe the CME. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Well, actually, thank you to, to, to all the speakers. You all did a great job making all the presentations to fit in the, in the allocated time. So if there are questions, I remind everybody that it can be asked during the discussion session. So I think we have a few minutes before the, the next talk. I think we can just 